Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of the Women of Wrestling podcast here on Ring Bells. Irish G. Allen and Freaky Lee Burton here uh, bringing you uh, episode 46 as we continue the inexorable march to episode 50. Well, it's less of a march, more sort of a rudderless amble more than anything else. Yes, it's becoming a bit of an in-joke now. We have no idea what we're going to do for our 50th show, but if we keep mentioning it, uh, then I don't know, maybe something special will happen. We will see. It's going to be a big surprise for everyone, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah, uh, let alone ourselves. But uh, we got stuff. Uh, we we got plenty of stuff happening before we ever get as far as uh, as far as podcast fifty. Uh, and we've got a podcast for you right now with the rate tank Kelly Skeeter. Yeah, a little bit of a confession. This intro has been recorded after the interview, and there's a reason why we're mentioning that to you because there's something in the interview that we weren't able to talk about. Yes. Um, we we were talking to uh, Skater about her uh, her plans for uh, America because she's just been uh, announced as uh, taking part in uh, Shimmer this past week, and of course she'll be at Fan Fatale in Montreal as well, and uh, CWF as well for their uh, uh, iPay per view. Um, but she was also uh, going to be on the Shine Show, and uh, we talked about that. And uh, she said that uh, she hadn't officially been announced for the Shine Show yet, so we shouldn't probably announce it. Uh, so. Lo and behold, moments after we wrapped the interview, uh, we noticed on Facebook that, uh, yeah, Shine 4 had been announced with Kelly Skater. Yeah, not just Kelly Skater. There are some other names that have been announced who are going to be making their Shine debuts. Yes. Uh, the the champ, uh, Soraya, is going to be defending against uh, Jazz. So, yeah, that's her first official Shimmer title defence. Also on the show, you've got uh, Skater's fellow Australian Shazza McKenzie, is going to be there. Davina Rose is also going to be part of the card, and also uh, um, some some chick from Ireland. Rhea O'Reilly. Yeah, she's going to be there as well. Yes, she's she going to love will. me saying that. Oh, she will. Uh, but yeah, she she returns to the US, uh, and also on Shine Four making her debut, uh, women's wrestling veteran Brandy Wine. So there's quite a uh, an interesting mix of talent there, from uh, from experienced to uh, still new. And Shine 4 kind of falls in the middle of what is essentially another silly season for women's wrestling. There are so many shows and so many events taking place over the next two months. Um, just we, We've listed them all in the roundup with as many matches that we know of at, at prep time. But uh, just as an example, uh, next weekend on September the 30th, Insane Championship Wrestling holds its fierce female show in Scotland. You've got let's see you've got pwwa which we talk about with skater on october the 6th also on october the 6th you've got ukw and waww's first joint show you've got rainer world's first american show the day after you've got joshi for hope in japan you've got bombshell ladies of wrestling in the midweek the following week doing their eye pay-per-view that weekend there's wsu having their first card since being taken over by beyond wrestling the day after that it's tna bound for glory uh, with miss tess marker versus tara Shine 4 the weekend after that. There is Shimmer the weekend after that with four DVD tapings. The weekend after that, there is NCW Femme Fatale 10. The weekend after that, there is Pro Wrestling Eve with Alpha Female versus Nikki Storm and Angelina Love versus Carmel Jacob. I mean, there's just a huge amount of wrestling in a small amount of time. And breathe. <sighs> Jesus. Well, well done. And uh, yeah, we I never will, realized my lungs were that big. We will try our best to uh, bring you coverage of as many of those shows as we can. We will aim to bring you coverage of all of those shows, but uh, we are but men. We are but men indeed. <laughs> so if you yeah. are. I'm, I'm more of a sort of um, overgrown boy. <laughs> well, now, um, <laughs> on that note, because I don't know where to go from that. Uh, I'm going to throw to the interview. Have we got anything else to say? Please, let's just get to Skater before I say something else that's really stupid. Right. Um, let's, uh, let's throw to the interview then. Let's uh, get some uh, music, and we will be back with you in just a second with Kelly Skater. And we are back with the Colossus of Bacchus Marsh. She has muscles that make the Incredible Hulk green with envy. She's indestructible. She is the Rit Tank Kelly Skater, and she is our guest on the Women of Wrestling podcast. Skater, how goes it? Very good, thanks, mate. Yourself? Yeah, yeah, not bad, not bad. <laughs> that was fun doing Joe Eastman's introduction. Oh, I'm sitting here posing at home. Good, I'm glad, I'm glad. I would expect nothing less, quite frankly. 
I'd be disappointed in myself. Yes. We don't want that. Well, you are a return guest to the podcast. We did speak to you like a couple of Christmases ago, but uh, we've always meant to get you back on to do a, a full podcast. And turns out that uh, 2012 has been a, uh, a pretty packed year for you so far. We're going to talk about what you've been doing this year and where you've been and, and all those kind of stories. But uh, just recently you were announced this past week as uh, returning to Shimmer for their yep. next tapings, uh, October uh, 28th and 29th. At the Berwyn, yes, very at, happy to be back. At the Berwyn Eagles Club is going to be your eighth time back there. Yeah, uh, filling out the passport very quickly. Yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when you when you were announced as uh, as being back at Shimmer, you you were posting some pictures on your Twitter of some of your previous uh, appearances <laughs> and you know some of your different looks over the years and so on as you uh, became the rate tank we know and love today. Um, yeah. Eight trips. Uh, what, what you know? Could could I could I ask you like, have you got a favourite memory of your trips so far? Is there one trip that particularly stands out to you? Hmm, that's actually a really hard question because all my trips have been so awesome. I think one of my favourite moments, just because of how much I love Serena, was uh, her return. Actually, being in the ring for the reaction the fans gave Deebs was just ridiculous. Like you get the goosebumps and. You know, you're trying to look mad, but you're just like, ah, oh. that was probably the highlight of Shimmer Trips to me. I remember it well, because you had your back to uh, to the entrance, so you, you must have felt the crowd and heard the crowd and, you know, you know what's going on, but you can't react to it yet. Yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. Like, I think the hardest part was not having this huge grin on my face because... Uh, it was just such a good moment, really. And well, Serena's, was, like, the loveliest person. And that all happened kind of... The, the Serena return to Shimmer was... It was kind of a bit under the radar, so to speak, but uh, when, when, how far in advance did you find out that you were going to be Serena's opponent for her comeback? I think it was either that morning or the night before. I can't remember exactly. I, I think it, maybe it was the day before. Yeah, it was the day before. And when you got told, what was your reaction? Because you know, there's anybody who who could have been picked to be her opponent, and and it was you. Yeah, I was I was a bit shocked, <laughs> um, and I was absolutely stoked, and of course nervous. But I'm pretty much always nervous. That's a good point, actually. I mean, you still uh, you still get nervous every time you go back, even though now you're a, a grizzled veteran of eight trips. Yeah, um, but my. Tra original trainer George who is in his 60s now said to me um he still gets nervous to this day and he thinks it it's a sign of how much you care so I don't really think it's a bad thing getting nervous what was your um your feelings on your first trip to shimmer because obviously you'd be, you'd be pretty nervous with that kind of occasion as well um what 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 are your memories of that first trip over there and trying to make an impression Oh, I was terrified. I'd actually never left the country. So for me, it was a first time going overseas at all. And I was walking into a locker room, which, you know, I'd respected and I'd watched the DVDs. And, oh, I was I was terrified, but I managed to make friends pretty quickly and relax a little bit. I actually remember uh, my first day sitting in the locker room and having a talk about pickle races with Mercedes in danger. About what? That's kind of what broke the <laughs> pickle races. You know, when you throw pickles at a window and you see whose pickle hits the floor first. No, I've never heard of this before in my <laughs> life. No, 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 all right. You need to go try it now. That was kind of like the icebreaker of making friends there, uh, pickle racing. There was a picture which you put on your Twitter quite recently of your um, your first trip there, and uh, yeah, you do look slightly different. Yeah, even I thought that. When I was um, looking at the pictures, I'm like, wow, I've changed a lot. I should really put this up like as a laugh. So I, I put the picture up and I think some of the newer fans were kind of like, whoa. Is it kind of like, um, you know, like when you see yourself either when, when you're maybe gaining weight or losing weight you know, and uh, you don't really notice it until you take a look back at a certain period of time and you think, all right, that's a stark difference to, to what I am now. Is it kind of like that, that you just didn't really notice the change over that period of time? Yeah, I think that pretty much was the case because uh, 
Yeah, since then a lot's changed. I think the most noticeable part, though, is probably the hair colour. Do you reckon? uh, Probably, yeah. But for me, um, I was just happy to bulk up a little bit because I stopped getting called scrawny. So that's what I noticed. I noticed you become a lot more muscular over over this period of time. You can really tell that you are. I hate to use the term, but jacked is what you are these days. Thank you. Uh, It was actually after that Shima. And getting uh, ribbed about getting called scrawny and stuff, I wanted to try to bulk up a little bit. And I had absolutely no idea how because I was going to the gym and I just wasn't putting on any weight. So I I was complaining to Madison, like, man, I just can't put on weight. So she told me to uh, get on protein. So I started taking protein then and I kind of like started using it for my gimmick stuff. So it was basically Madison telling me to start using protein, which ended up leading to the jackness and to the protein gimmick. Well, when she you, calls it protein. Yeah, you, when you say protein, you mean reroids, don't you? <sighs> that is dirty allegations caused by Alice in Danger. I, I, look, if you, if you just want to come out and, and, and be honest, people, I'm sure, will try and help you through it. <sighs> there is no steroids from this Australian women's wrestler, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That sounds like an allegation of something. Something. Else. <laughs> Read into it, whatever you will. Oh, don't worry, we will. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you debuted against uh, against Lefisto, uh Volume yes. Twenty Three, and uh, I'm just going to say, like, I mean, you, you debuted with a pretty cool match, and you've you've had a, a just a, a great sort of run of of names. You know, usually people beating the hell out of you but you've, you've gone through a, a tremendous list of talent I mean going into this next uh, set of tapings are there people that you still think you know what I'd love to get a chance to wrestle this person oh of course um, there's so many people on the on the shimmer roster that you know you'd love to wrestle for me I guess people like I'd love to wrestle Yumi in a singles because I was really happy with the tag match we had in Japan um, of course you know you want to aim at the best, so I'd love to fight Soraya, even though I'm probably taking a death wish there. Uh, who else? Mizunami's pretty cool. Uh, I got to see a little bit of her stuff in Japan. She's really different, so I think she's going to bring um, an interesting factor in that I'd love to test myself against. Uh, I don't know. There's just so many girls. I don't think there's anyone on the Shimo roster I wouldn't fight, you know what I mean? I was just wondering, is there anybody who, like, you've wrestled in the past in those kind of, maybe those open challenge kind of matches, which was, you know, kind of, you know, the, the bravado thing, you call somebody out, they smash your face in. Is there anybody <laughs> who who was on that list who you wrestled in the past who you'd like to maybe wrestle as a as more sort of, I don't know, quote-unquote, competitive kind of match? Hmm. Well... I guess it'd be pretty fun to go um, another round with Debs. Or uh, even Lefisto, like we've fought again in a um, four corner match, but we haven't had another singles since our first one. So it'd be kind of interesting to see where I've come from, you know, match one to we're coming up to the 50th taping, and I've been around since 23, I think it was. Mm-hmm. So I think it'd be kind of interesting to see Kelly Skater volume 23 versus Kelly Skater volume whatever. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Yeah, that would be uh, be a hell of a change. Um, interesting that you mentioned about the tag match you had with Yumioka earlier this year, mentioning Rio Mizunami and seeing her in Japan. That was kind of the next thing I wanted to move on to, and that's the fact that 2012 has been a, a big year for travel, as far as you're concerned. Uh, you got to basically go over and, and live in Japan for uh, what was it, three months? Yep, three months. And it's living in Japan, training in Japan. Um, being a pro wrestler in Japan for three months, that's got to be pretty much your dream, right? Yeah, it, it was exactly my dream. So uh, it was the most ridiculous start to a year I've ever had and definitely the best start to any year I've ever had. Yeah, actually, I say 2012. Um, you, you went over just before Christmas uh, last year. Yeah. Um, what was Christmas in Japan like? Different. Uh, it was my first Christmas away from home, so that was, you know, always a little bit difficult. But I actually wrestled twice on Christmas Eve and once on Christmas Day. So uh, that was that was very different. And then um, Hashi took me out bowling and to dinner. So I can honestly say I've never bowled on Christmas before. 
the Japan trip in itself, um, how did it come about? Uh, I, I'm just interested in, in uh, what your original plan was and what, what you thought you were going to be doing out there. Uh, well, basically, I'd been brought over to Japan earlier in the year um, with Raina. And while I was there, I was asked if I'd want to come back, you know, in a longer term type of deal and working as a freelancer. And I said, yeah, I'd love that. So we kind of like negotiated and things like that. And I got brought over in, I guess, their peak period, which is kind of Christmas to maybe a couple of months in. And I knew I was going to be working for at least two promotions and we'll just kind of see from there how I go. And uh, Hiroyo actually got me into training. So the obvious question then is training in Japan versus uh, training in Australia. How, how different was it? Incredibly different. There's such a huge emphasis on fitness in Japan. Like we wouldn't even basically start rolling until about an hour into training because we'd be doing like 500 squats and hundreds of push-ups. and We'd do a lot of... Um, shoot style wrestling like just trying to tap each other out and things like that which is crazy for cardio um it's very very physically tough the training in japan and i know there are some schools in australia which are very heavy fitness as well but they're not anywhere near my house so i, I don't know the training for me was just a whole nother level and because you know i wasn't going to a second job i could go to training whatever days i wanted there's a big difference between juggling work, your bookings and training and living as a wrestler and being able to go to training every day if you want to. It was just crazy. I loved it. Financially then, how do you sort of keep yourself going out there? Because like you said, you're not working. You're training and you're, you're taking the, the, um, the, the freelance bookings wherever you can. Financially, was it ever a case of you thinking, oh, God, how am I going to kind of make ends meet while I'm out there? No, it was okay. Like, I was getting a fair amount of wrestling work while I was there. So, and um, I'm not going to go into pay rates or anything over no, there, no, no. but I wasn't struggling. It was good. It was, it was being able to live as a wrestler there. I mean, that's kind of the dream, really, for, for wrestlers, isn't it? The fact that you know, the wrestling is your job. Yeah, it's it's uh, amazing. Like, it's what you aim for. So, it was de definitely um, the best thing I've done. Who was in charge of the uh, the training that you were doing then? Uh, I trained at Zero One, and Akuto Hidaka is the trainer there, uh, and he is absolutely amazing. Unsurprising, he's he's a hell of a hell of a wrestler. Yeah, he's great. Like, I actually watched a whole bunch of Zero One shows while I was there and I was just blown away. I'm like, man, I am really, really lucky to be getting trained by him. And he brings um, such a unique style of training because he not only knows, you know, the Japanese style, but he knows the lucha style and things like that as well. So he knows your shoot wrestling stuff. I actually went to some um, shoot boxing classes with him later at night. So you just got everything rolled into one really what about the language barrier then i mean was that difficult for you oh uh, yeah it was it was difficult when i first got there i mean i learned some words as i went along which made it a little bit easier but before you adjust i think there's like a two-week adjustment period where the first two weeks you're like whoa you just mind's blown and you start to like wonder if you're going to be able to handle it because you're like, oh, I feel so bad. I can't communicate this to this person in their own language. But you do um, get a bit more used to it and you learn enough to get by and then you start learning more fun words as well. And it, <laughs> It's difficult, but you can do it. You know what I mean? The hardest part is that you're, I don't know, the hardest part for me was that I was stressed out. I couldn't communicate properly in someone's own language in their country. Mm, I I always feel that way when I go to another country which has a different language. I always feel very embarrassed if I don't really know how to communicate with them in their in their native tongue. I mean, when when you went there, was it intimidating having that situation where you're thinking, okay, I I don't really know how to communicate that well. How, how am I going to be able to get around and 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 live essentially? Yeah, it was, it was a bit intimidating. As I said, the first two weeks, like the um, adjustment period. But luckily, I know some of the important sayings. Like I know the pleasantries and I know how to ask 
where is this if I get lost? And it was just, I don't know, like communicating with my friends I actually found more difficult than strangers because with strangers I generally knew enough to get by and to be polite if I was dealing with a shopkeeper or whatnot. But I actually got a lot more embarrassed around my friends because I was worried, am I pronouncing something wrong? Or you need to have a lot more detailed conversations and I'd be struggling to try to find the words. I know a couple of your um, sort of better friends over there uh, you talked to me about were uh, were Hiroyo and Tomoka, (laughs) who, you know, obviously Shimmer fans will know. Um, And they've, you know, they've got, from what you were telling me, pretty decent English as well. So like between, between your Japanese and their English, was that kind of how you got around it? Yeah, well, with those two girls, I never really have much of a problem unless I'm speaking too much slang for them. <laughs> but, though both of those girls speak really good English and they actually help me out a lot. On my um, first day back wrestling was uh, Christmas Eve and first show off was Joshi for Hope. And this is when I was starting to like stress a lot because I'd only been back in the country two days and – I, you know, didn't want to go into the locker room by myself and I didn't want to say anything, but I was stressing out a little bit and I think Tomoka could tell I was stressed out. So she really looked after me and translated anything I need to and Hiroyo did the same thing. You know, she got me into training, translated when I needed it. They were really, really good to me over there. I mean, Japanese-wise, give, a, give us a crash course on on the, the, the key words or the key phrases that you should probably know if you're going out there? Because I always wonder, what are the best things to know uh, uh, to say to get yourself around very quickly? Well, I found, um, well, of course, you need for wrestling, you need to know, like, uh, my name is, it's nice to meet you for the first time. Please treat me well in future dealings. Um, to and introduce yourself, it's Watashi no name wa Kelly Skater Des. She's like, my name is Kelly Skater. And Hajime Mashte is pleased to meet you for the first time. And Yoroshiku Onagai Shimas is like, treat me well in further dealings. Uh, I also found the phrase I needed the most when I was getting around was where is, because I got horribly lost my first trip to Japan and I was actually meeting people, so I was by myself at the time. And I couldn't find my way because I couldn't ask anyone, where am I? So, uh, doko desu ka is like, where is? But you actually add where you want to go before the sentence. Right. And th- that saved my butt a bunch of times because <laughs> I'll get lost and I'd, I'd ask a nice Japanese person, uh, excuse me, where is this? And that always helped me out. These are all getting logged down for, uh, for my Japanese trip whenever the hell that happens. Awesome. I know some pretty bad words too, but I probably shouldn't repeat them. Now, yeah, you on. should. Now, hang on a second. I, I remember you and I had a bit of a chat about uh, about your your trip to Japan a few months ago in Montreal when we were in fan, we were up a fan fatale together. And I seem to remember. I can't remember the exact circumstance, but I seem to remember you telling me a story about how you learned some 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 bad words from some people. It's part of a, sort of a, part of a rib, was it? Uh, no. The funny thing was I actually didn't learn bad words until near the end of my trip because every time someone would try to teach me bad words, Hachi would be like, no, no, don't teach her. (laughs) So I went out with a couple of the girls drinking and we were hours and hours into a drinking trip. So I turned to them and I said, please teach me bad words. So they're like, okay. So I ended up getting um, a piece of paper and a pen. I'm like, okay, now teach me. So when they were telling me the bad words, I'd write them down and then repeat them. Okay, this is correct, and what does it mean? But they would actually teach me by telling me, okay, now say this to this person when you wrestle her and say this to this person. I'm like, oh, I'm going to die. I think the only person who I actually did say anything to was uh, Mima Shimoda. I called her basically crazy, basically the equivalent of crazy bitch in a match, and she thought it was hilarious. So it's like, okay, I didn't die. Thank God. Okay. So, all right. Don't give us the English translation, but just give us some, some, some bad words to say in Japanese. Okay. Bakayoro. Uh, Zenigeiba. Abzure. 
And that's like some of the main ones. I think there's Kuso Yaro as well. But uh, yeah, they're not very good words. <laughs> I was actually on Skype to Ray one day and I jokingly said one of them, just like, whoa, no, who taught you that? Bad word. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> so, so sweet. So when um, I think it was Natsuki Teo sent a joking insult to me when we were going back and forth on Twitter and Ray piped up with, please stop teaching Kelly bad words. She only <laughs> memorizes the dishonest Japanese. Teach her honest Japanese. <laughs> awesome. But you did mention just uh, a few minutes ago about you going out drinking in Japan. Now, this is well, an entire conversation in itself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy over there. Uh, I was telling you guys before, my theory is... They eat so many carbs, they can just drink insane amounts. Because I could drink crazy amounts over there. And because I was eating, you know, the white rice and stuff like that, I found I wasn't getting, you know, shimmer level out of control. <laughs> shimmer level out of control. Is this what we now now define as being the top of the shop and the top of the mountain? Pretty much. This is skates on the verge of death. <laughs> Pretty much. I think I've proven that over the years. I know there were some really fun nights out over there. I had an absolute blast. I mean, my party partner lives in Japan, so it worked out well. This is why we used to ask guests when they came on the show if they had any good Kelly Skater stories. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. At least some of the people in Japan cannot translate the drinking story, so it's okay. Uh, well, don't worry, because what you just said was that uh, Hiroyu and Tomoka and now speak quite good English, so we can just ask them about some of your uh, crazy Japan drinking. It, it's okay, because I didn't really drink that much with Hiroyu, only a couple of nights, like my going away party and stuff. Usually I'd just kind of train with Hiroyu and hang out. Tomoka, we had a couple of big nights, but that shouldn't surprise anyone. She is my party partner. I guess that makes sense, but uh, as far as... um. The, the sort of culture of drinking, like you were saying. Isn't this something that kind of helped you out in the long run? Oh, well, yeah, because uh, I got some props because I like tequila. <laughs> I went to um, a party of a promotion I actually didn't work for yet. And I was drinking, like, just mixed drinks with them. And one of the girls pipes up and tells kind of the boss, oh, Kelly likes tequila. Her eyes lit up. Really? Come drink with me. So we ended up getting pretty drunk. And I was actually speaking more Japanese the drunker I got. And she ended up thinking I was really funny. And I worked their show next week. So, so was, in other words, the best way to get booked in Japan is to get horrendously drunk with, with other wrestlers. I wouldn't say horrendously drunk because you don't want to be too much of a dick. But I guess, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> being one of the girls and get letting people get to know you is a good way like socialize because they would never have met me if I hadn't socialized and I guess just be respectful be one of the girls and work hard it sounds like you did a lot of sort of positive networking then because like you said you go out there you you, you're planning to be out there for a certain amount of time you haven't got bookings to cover yourself for for all this time so you really have to kind of network and, and put yourself around don't you yeah well networking is always a good idea in wrestling in general Plus, apart from this, the fact it gets you booked more, you get to meet really cool people and you make friendships and things like that. I already had certain bookings before I came. Like It was organised I'd be wrestling for certain companies, but I picked up more bookings over there because I did put myself out there and just get to know people. Well, let, let's look at the list of some of the places that you did wrestle while you were there. There was there was Rainer, like you mentioned. There was uh, there was Stardom. There was Wave. You did Joshi for Hope as well. It just seemed like a you had a very eclectic um, number of promotions that you worked for, and, and you know, as, as a result, an eclectic number of opponents. Yeah, I also wrestled on a zero one dojo show in a pretty ridiculous match too. It was good. Um, I think each promotion has their strength as well, and it's something really different from the other promotions. So for me, it was really, really fun to work everywhere because you got something from each promotion that you just wouldn't get anywhere else. For example, you know, you've got Stardom, which is a bit more of a hard-hitting promotion, but you've got a lot of younger girls coming up there as well that are kind of under Nana A's guidance. Um, and I think Stardom's great. I, ha I really enjoyed my time there. Um, Wave is very uh, – it's got a lot of the older girls in it, the ones that have been around, you know, your 
eight years plus type of thing. And they've got some great comedy wrestlers there, like better comedy wrestlers than I've seen in any other country. So for me, getting to wrestle Hiroda was bloody hilarious. Um, Reina has a really good mix of international talent. They've got a lot of Mexican girls. They had Canadian, Australian, whatnot. Joshi for Hope is kind of everyone coming together because you've got girls from each company and you get to have some matchups that you might not get to have otherwise. And uh, Zero One Dojo Show was fun because I actually got to wrestle um, a guy like in a mixed tag match. That was Daichi Hashimoto, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was me and Craig Classic versus Hiroya Matsumoto and Daichi Hashimoto. I was a big fan of his father. What was Daichi like to wrestle? Really good. It was the first time Daichi's wrestled a girl, so he was all nervous. Really? <laughs> and Yeah. Uh, Daichi's a really good young talent. Um, we trained together, obviously. Um, he came to kickboxing a couple times as well. So I got to know him pretty well while I was there, and I watched a lot of his matches. And He's really young still, but he's already good, so it's going to be interesting to see how good he gets when he's got that experience behind him. Because he's only, I think, 20 now? Yeah, he's, he is quite young. Yeah, but he's genetically, hopefully, uh, will be... If he's anywhere near as good as his old man, he'll, he'll be doing well. Yeah, I, th- I think you're going to see some really big things over the years from him. Tell us about the uh, tell us about the black eye that you received uh, in one of the <laughs> matches. It wasn't so much a black eye as it was like a big yellow mark across a quarter of your face. Um, yeah, that was <laughs> that was in um, a tag match. Me and Tomoka versus Courtney Rush and Yumioka, and I got kicked in the face in the maybe halfway into the match which I barely even registered because my adrenaline was up, whatnot. I didn't really realise much was wrong until um, the referee, tommy son, jumped on me and kept asking me, are you okay? Like, I'm fine, no problem, no problem. After the match, same thing. I get backstage and Hiroyo, like, brings me ice to my shoulder and brings me another thing of ice. She's like, for your face. I'm like, what? <laughs> then I <laughs> look in the mirror and see I've already got a lump forming. I was like, oh, okay, whatever. And, yeah, by the time we went out for dinner, um, Tomoka's like, go look in the mirror. Um, my face had gone blue, like bright blue. I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting tomorrow morning. And sure enough, when I woke up, Courtney Rush was like, dude, you look horrible. So, of course, <laughs> That's of course a nice I thing face- to hear. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So, of course, I face- Facebooked the pictures and whatnot and ended up getting a very angry call from my father later that day. Um, basically telling me I should come home and I'm an idiot. And I was like, oh, no, Dad's freaking out. He's like, is your face broken? I'm like, Dad, I'm okay. <laughs> you got black eyes playing football. It's no big deal. Yeah. He was fine once he calmed down. but Yeah, but this is his daughter, you know. Yeah, that's true. But I was just like, man, I'm fine. Like, You've got worse black eyes playing football, I'm sure. So, so what was it then? Just bruising? Yeah, it's just bruise. I, I, where the kick landed was directly at the corner of my eye, so it just missed my eye. And I guess, you know, face bruises tend to look pretty bad. Certainly one way you could look at it, yeah. I'll have to take your word for it on that one. Well, I, it, like, that it like hurt a for a couple of days, but it wasn't that bad. Like, it hurt a little bit, but – and it took a long time to, to fade. I actually crossed over customs with slight yellow still. But – um. It wasn't a big deal. It, I wasn't mad about it or I wasn't overly phased about it. It was just kind of like, oh, okay, this is a pretty sweet Facebook picture. I mean, did you um, did you try to try to like mask it or cover it up or anything like that with makeup or did you just kind of think, oh, I'll just leave it as is? I just left it as is because there was no point even trying to cover it. It was fairly ridiculous. I mean, you're not much actually, of a sort of makeup wearer in the ring anyway, are you? No, I, I got forced to wear makeup, so I wear enough to get by. <laughs> it, I actually had stardom I think it was two or three days later and the girls walked in they're like whoa what happened I got kicked in the face it's okay no problem no problem it, it would have been too I think trying to hide it with my minimal level of makeup skill I would have made it look ten times worse you are such a tomboy aren't you ridiculous you have no idea you should try watch me try to walk in heels 
you know what? It, it, I think uh, it's something that I want to see because any time that you seem to put up a, a tweet, a picture of yourself in a dress, the whole uh, Twitter goes crazy. Like, oh, my God, she's wearing a dress. Is something wrong? Yeah, that also happened at the party as well. When I turned up to the party, um, Madison's like, oh, my God, you look like a girl. Like, Thanks, buddy. <laughs> That's horrific. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure how you react to a statement like that. I, mean, well, I know I how I'd react. I'd be very offended. <laughs> I wasn't offended because I knew she meant it as a compliment. And she was very quick. No, you know, I just mean that you look, like, girled up. I'm like, it's all good. Yeah, I, think, I like I think being I comfortable. It, I think if I did, if they'd, they'd probably be quite upset that I showed up in drag. <laughs> but isn't that English humour? Hey! It, 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 she's got us <laughs> yeah, there. All right, yeah, fair, yeah, it yeah. is. That's okay. Right, can... Australians think it's pretty funny as well. Okay, I'll, I've worn a dress once. I'm not surprised. It, look, it was part of my university course. It was a it was a module on gender differences. I wore a dress to try and prove a point. Well, I'm sure you probably shouldn't want to be podcasting this because Elson Danger's going to have a field day. Really wish I hadn't told that story. <laughs> kind of glad you did. Anyway, Japan. <laughs> You mentioned Courtney Rush anyway. I mean, Courtney Rush came over near the your, your, the end of your time there. So what was it like almost being the kind of the veteran there and, and uh, showing Courtney around? It was good fun, actually. She was my roommate for the two weeks. So we, um, we had a blast. Uh, there were a couple of days, you know, I couldn't take her out sightseeing when I wanted her to see certain things. So I'd actually – because, you know, I had um, meetings I had to go to or training and whatnot – so I'd actually leave her a detailed list of, okay, you need to do this, this, this. You get on this train at this platform. And I, w- I was very proud of myself for knowing Tokyo well enough to be able to write a list of directions. But it's a big city, isn't it? Yes. It's um, many stations. It, it was really fun, though, getting to show her some stuff that I like over there. Like Hachi and I took her to the temple, which I love the temples there. It's one of my favorite places in Japan. So we um, took her to that and then we were trying to think of how to kill a day until we met up with Tonka. So we just kind of went walking and we found a theme park, which is totally up my alley because it had giant Pikachus I could pose with and a Sailor Moon thing and rides. So we're like, whatever we're doing right now, we're cancelling it and we're going to that place. It was a little kid theme park. And we actually uh, made snowmen that were maybe the size of my hand but it was my first ever snowman, so I was totally stoked. Oh, I forgot about you in snow. Yeah, you, uh, as an Australian, you don't get to see it very often. No, it's, it's a very rarity. And, of course, I had to take out Courtney Rush to see the bars of Japan. The amount of times <laughs> oh, she yeah. woke up. Oh, yeah, Blair Courtney, yeah. Oh, the amount of times she woke up going, I don't want to drink tequila again. I'm like, well, we're going out tonight. Stop torturing uh, she- the poor woman. Hey, she likes tequila now. I think I was a good influence. Yes, it's always a good thing to get one of your friends absolutely riddled off her face on tequila. Well, she never, like, was On a nightly bad. basis. She wasn't that bad. She, like, was never, you know, misbehaved or anything. We just had... We taught her some drinking games. Yeah. Japan-style drinking games. Such as? Sorry? Such as what drinking games? Oh, um, there's this, oh, I don't even know how to describe it that well. Um, That's always a good start. It's this wooden board game and there's letters and it says zero, no, sorry, one to nine. And you roll two dice and let's say you roll a two and a three. You can either flip over the two tile, the three tile or the five tile. And you're taking turns of rolling the dice until you can't flip a tile. And if you cannot flip a tile, you have to drink. And you have to do a shot. And then you just reset it and play again. So are these boards and and dice and stuff in the bar? Yeah. There's a bar we go to in Rapongi, which has every board game you could possibly think of. It even has Wii games and stuff like that. We played Barrel of Monkeys in there one day. Nothing's, nothing's more fun than a barrel of monkeys, I understand. How very racist. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was just ridiculous because I was just being a smart ass one day when I was in there. This is before um, Courtney Rush got there. And I was like, 
we're playing a couple ball games. It's like, well, if only they had Jenga. Two seconds later, there's Jenga in front of me. I'm like, holy crap, this is awesome. So we played Jenga at the bar and whoever knocked it down had to drink. That's a long game to play just to, to end up with one drink. Not, not really, because the drunker you get, the quicker people knock it down. That's a fair point. I didn't consider this. <laughs> I taught long them all how to play, to play spoons, games. though. How would you play spoons? Spoons is fantastic. The girls love this one. Basically, it's like musical chairs but with spoons. So you've got – if you've got six players, you've got five spoons. And one person starts with a deck of cards and deals out four cards to each person. Then they put the deck next to them and they pick up a card off the top of the deck. Then they discard one card. And you do it as quickly as you can. You play until you get four of a kind, like say four aces or four twos. When you've got four of a kind, you can grab a spoon. But when one person has grabbed a spoon, anyone can. You try to be sneaky about it and you wait and see who doesn't get the spoon drinks. The, the end of that game sounds a little bit like Thumb Master, but we'll discuss this another time because I think we're talking a lot about <laughs> drinking games at the moment. <laughs> Let's get back to wrestling. Must we? Well, <laughs> no, you fair, know, yeah, yeah. Fair, 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 fair point, fair point. Um, after your uh, after your shimmer, or sorry, after your Japan trip, then it was uh, it was over to the US and Canada for uh, for Shimmer and Fan Fatale, and um, I think at Shimmer you kind of moved away from your traditional opening card slot to uh, match a little bit further up the card, and you had some really good matches. Um, but I do remember everyone I spoke to all saying, oh, "Man, Skaters like." improved so much did you feel a lot more comfortable and confident after your time in japan did you did you sort of think okay i'm really becoming a much better competitor now yeah i definitely felt like the time in japan improved me a lot it just gave me a bigger repertoire as well because learning so many different stuff at zero one i felt more confident in general i mean having that background and Wrestling so many different people gives you the confidence to throw more into your matches and believe in yourself a little bit more. And, yeah, I, I think the best thing I could have done is had that solid base of training to improve myself. You had a mix, good mix of matches at the last Shimmer as well. You had like a really good match with Spinelli and you had a couple of matches against some Joshi talent as well, Ray and Kana. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely a, a step up the card for you. Yeah, I actually had a, a lot of fun in those matches, especially the Spinelli one, because we'd never, I didn't really know much of her stuff. We never really, we'd never wrestled each other before. We didn't know each other that well at the time. And I just had so much fun in that match. It's like, wow, that was, that was awesome. Like, that was what wrestling's about, enjoying yourself. And I was really happy with um, wrestling the Joshi on that show. And, Getting the reaction I got after the Kana match was crazy. Like, for me, it was like, whoa, what's going on type of thing. Now, I haven't seen the uh, the Kana match. Stu has because he was there. I haven't because I wasn't. Um, it's going to be part of the DVDs which are being released very imminently, 47 and 48. Uh, 45 and 46 were already out. But uh, what was... What was that match like? Because you know, Kana has a has an aura about her. So, what was it like wrestling Kana? Uh, hard hitting. Although, you know what? It's probably one of my favourite matches I've had at Shimmer. Um, the match itself wasn't a very long match. I would I would say it'd be under ten minutes, but it was very action packed. There was some very very stiff strikes. There was some submission stuff going on. Um, I've never been hit so hard in my life, but I think I gave it back pretty good as well. Oh, I don't know. It, it was different, I think. I really, really enjoyed it, but it was like a war type of thing. Fair point, I guess. Uh, from from there then, at uh, Shimmer, it was up to uh, Fan Fatale in, in Montreal, and you got a chance to take on uh, Kira at the last Fan Fatale show. Um what did you make of uh, the Pink Flash? I think she's a really, really good up-and-coming talent. She's still very new. Mm -hmm. She hasn't been around that long. And I don't know, I was just really impressed by her. I thought she did really well. Um, I think she's going to be one to watch in maybe a year or so. Sure, I'd probably agree with that, yeah. yeah. Um, and then 
most depressingly of all, you've uh, spent most of the rest of the year back home. Oh, you're terrible. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but uh, my yeah, family's pretty happy. I'm sure they're. I'm sure they're pleased to see you. Um, but yeah, you're... as you brought back all the washing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like four months of washing. There you go. It's like clean my gear. I've I've had to spray it with a breeze for four months. It's rotting. I'd just like to say we had a washing machine in our apartment, so Did there was no used? grossness. Did it ever Sorry. get used, or was it just something to sit on? Yes, we used it. Uh, we we had you know, I wrestled that often. It'd be kind of gross if I didn't wash my gear. It's all right. You could beat all your opponents by submission. It's chemical Ugh. warfare. Gross. Let's not go there. I've said more yeah, disgusting things in my time. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, you, you know the little thing, Lee, that we've talked about when you think of things and there's little little voices <laughs> and that's not a good thing to say? Oh, dude, I have no moral barometer at all. We all know this. Fair enough. This is why you get chopped. This is why I get chopped. <laughs> <laughs> right, anyway. We don't but, talk about that either. Yeah, the first rule of... Uh, Lee Burton shopping as we do not talk about Lee Burton shopping ever again. <laughs> yeah, um, back in Australia though, um, how's it been back in uh, back in the homeland? Uh, what's the scene like over there? I know we're building up to the next PWA show, but uh, you know, talk us through how things are are looking down under at the minute. Well, I only wrestle for a, a few promotions in Australia because I try to, you know. Um, spend my time while I'm here catching up with family and wrestling for for promotions that I really want to work for. Mm -hmm. But the promotions I've been working for have been going really well. MCW's been coming along with some really big shows lately. They're branching out of their usual area and they've had some great cards. Uh, I've been up for um, NHPW a few times, which is in Perth, which is actually really far from my house. It's about a uh, four or five hour plane flight. And last show was pretty ridiculous because uh, show two, it was myself, Colt Cabana and Concrete Davison versus Jonah Rock, Sway and Cracker Jack. So that was utterly ridiculous. And you, you've seen Cracker Jack, so you can, I'm sure, know where that's going. Yeah, he's a bona fide lunatic. Ridiculous. Uh, covered in scars, very hairy and... Borderline insane. Like, I've seen him come to the ring with a rubber chicken and talk to the chicken and hit people with it. And it's going to be some ridiculous matches. And he, of course, his uh, sister, Cracker Jill, which looks very surprisingly like Cracker Jack in a dress. That's just a rumor. It's all allegations. And I know about allegations, so I don't want to, you know, pin them on him too much. Um, the main thing for me, though since I've been back, has been PWWA. We had our tournament to crown an interim champion and we've got our next show coming up, which, you know, I've I've only got one aim that show, let's be honest. And that is? Well, I believe that I should be getting a title shot against Evie. That's just my opinion. Um, She's the interim champion. I was the first ever champion. And I just feel I've got unfinished business with Evie. So my goal at PWWA is to be Evie and to take back the belt. We've seen pictures of your um, match that you had in the interim title tournament against Evie. There's one that we mentioned to her when I spoke to her for Fight Like a Girl last month. And there's a match, well, there's a shot in the match of, uh, I think it's a suplex on the floor. And yep. you can see on one side of the ring, there's padding. <laughs> That's not the side of the ring that you're on. You're on the part that's just a, a bare hardwood floor. And I said to Evie at the time that you're completely insane. And I'm going to say the same thing to you. You're completely insane. Well, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of suplexing someone on the floor if you're going to do it where the mats are. Yeah, but it sucks. <laughs> it's all right. I'm indestructible. Woman does raise an interesting point. She does. <laughs> What's it like wrestling yeah, but- Evie then? Evie is one of my favourite people in the world to wrestle. Um, I just think our styles mesh really well. Um, she hits very hard too, but I think I hit her back just as hard. Um, I don't know, like, I think it's one of the best finds PWWA has had over the last couple of years, like, bringing over the New Zealand girls, and she's definitely the best women's wrestler in New Zealand. 
And Evie is someone I could wrestle many, many times a year and not get bored wrestling. And I feel I liked our first match. I felt our second match was better than that. And I think we can keep building. So uh, hopefully we don't kill each other in the process. So it's that case of process of improvement then, as you know, with with each coming match, they just get greater and greater. Well, that's what I hope, and that's what I feel has happened so far. So hopefully, uh, match three can be uh, even better than match two, and just give the fans something to go home happy about. Really. Well, with this title ambition, and talking about the PWA interim title, I mean. If you go all the way back, because we haven't really talked much about your your history and your past, you debuted in uh, in the sort of spring of two thousand and seven, and about a year after that, you became the first PWWA champion. I mean, that's a that's a a, a great thing to have happen to somebody, you know, t- twelve to eighteen months into their career. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, PWWA is kind of where I really in Australia built my career because. It was thanks to working their shows, I got experience wrestling other girls apart from the small amount in my own home state, and I got noticed by other interstate promotions, like PWAC at the time started bringing me up. Um, and I, I just guess the exposure of being the first champion there and people actually getting to see me not wrestling in a very small area of Australia It was the best thing for my career because it led to more interstate bookings, which led to more international bookings. And so for me, PWWA has, is always going to have a huge place in my heart as being like an Australian home. You know what I mean? Mm. There's also the PWA show. I think I remember where, where you had your, uh, you had your hair straight and I think you came out to something like Britney Spears, didn't you? Ah, yeah, that was a rib. Um, (laughs) Basically, we straightened my hair as a joke type of thing because it was nowhere near our usual area. It was just a – it was a show that we worked that was pretty far out. I think it's about two hours from Sydney. And as a joke, we straightened my hair. I was wearing Jesse McKay's gear. And so I, I turned to Madison. I'm like, you guys have my ring music, yeah? Oh, yeah, 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 no worries, no worries. Like, okay, no problem. Uh, Britney Spears comes on. I'm like, oh, God, I just look at Alex. You're a jerk. And walk out. What crazy. Out of curiosity, what Britney Spears song was it? Oh, jeez, what was it? Uh, maybe it was that Womanizer one? I can't remember. That's a fine tune. Well done. <laughs> I, honestly, I can't remember because I didn't pick it. The girls did, and I had no idea it was coming. I told them I would have popped more if it was um, Hit Me Baby or something like that. That's so old school, though. Yeah, but it's still good. Oh, don't get me wrong. You know, it, it's a fine track. You know, you're talking to the king of cheese here. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a lot worse than what it, what it meant like in my head. <laughs> um, yeah, Danger's going to have a field day. This is a terrible thing that's going on right now. But no, I think um, there is there is a match on PWWA Volume 1, I think, that you have uh, your straight hair going on. Yeah, I think it was PWWA Volume 1, and that was against Jesse McKay. One of the funniest parts was, I don't think the camera actually caught it, when um, the music was playing and I was getting into the ring, Jesse was actually, like, dancing at me and going, I can be Britney, bitch. So I was trying so hard not to crack up. But I'm pretty sure the camera didn't catch it, which is a damn shame. If anybody just wants to see that match and see Skater not looking like Skater, that DVD is still available. I think it's at uh, pwaustralia.com, isn't it? Yes, that's the website. Yeah. And um, the tournament show should be out on DVD pretty soon, I would think. Hopefully before, uh, before the next Shimmer Tippings. Yeah, hopefully we can get the um, tournament show and the latest show on DVD and get them ready for Shimmer. Ooh, that would be good. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what their schedule is, but I know they're in the process of putting together the tournament show, so it, it shouldn't be too far. Yeah, I'd be looking forward to seeing that because it, it, unlike some other tournaments that you, that you get, it's not t- took place over the course of one evening. It did take place over the span of a couple of months. Yeah, it, it took place um, pretty much straight after I got back until recently, so it was a fair, 
fair stretch of time, which is really good because, you know, you haven't got the second round, everyone's absolutely buggered. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's some, there's some really good matches that should come out on that DVD. Um, I watched matches that were on shows I was on as well because they would usually film two of the first round, that type of thing. Mm. Um, the semifinals were both filmed on the same day. So I did get out there and watch the other girls' matches, and there's some really good stuff. The only one I haven't seen yet is Evie versus Jessie, which is bound to be good. Yeah, there's a lot of beatings going on. I know that uh, th- there was a live tweeting going on from uh, from Ree from uh, the Australian women's wrestling website, NHB Girls, and you could see as the match was going on, the tweets were getting more and more maniacal. <laughs> yes. I did notice that. I do follow that Twitter feed, so that was how I was keeping up with what was going on with um, the match that night because, you know, I had my eye on it. I wanted to know who won and who I'd be attempting to kick in the face at a later date. Yeah, it's always good to know who you're going to be kicking in the face. Yeah, there's a long list, real long list. Speaking of kicks, and this is a nice way to bring it into it because it just reminds me of the old free kick gimmick which you did at at a CWF Mid-Atlantic. When you head back over to the States uh, in October, you're going to be uh, part of the CWF Rumble Eye pay-per-view that's taking place on October the 20th uh, in an Arena Chicks match against Sassy Steffi. So what's it like to be able to go back to... uh, to, to CWF Mid-Atlantic? I'm actually really looking forward to it. Um, I've never wrestled Steffi before, so we've tagged, but we've never actually wrestled each other, so that'll be really fun. And I'm also in the Rumble, so I've already, Are you know, tweeted. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've already been announced for that, so I tweeted Chiva Kid and told him I'm going to kick him in the face since, you know, I haven't kicked him for so long. Yeah, I'm kid. looking forward to it. He'll be right. As long as... Um, Coach Gemini comes out with a whistle. We're all good. I got this. There was a lot of free kicking going on in that last match, uh, uh, which you can get on the uh, on the uh, Volume One Arena Chicks DVD, which is still out. Uh, that there was uh, the free kick gimmick, which is quite difficult to explain. Yeah, I, I guess the easiest way to explain it is uh, <laughs> I've actually got a pretty funny story. She might get mad at me, but I'll tell it anyway. Please do. Um, basically, in Australia, when we're playing Australian rules football. If someone blows a whistle, it means there's a free kick and the opposition, whoever gets infringed upon, basically can kick the ball without getting touched for a certain amount of time. When I was explaining this, uh, I think some wires got crossed and Amber O'Neill looks at me and goes, girl, I don't know why anyone would play this. I'm like, what? She's like, I can't believe when someone blows a whistle, you get to kick someone. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Mate, you don't get to kick. The other person, you get to kick the ball. Oh, I just had an amber moment. Oh, God. Is that what they're called, amber moments? Pretty much. It was oh, one of those you had to be there things, but it was so funny. She is a legitimate crack up. Her accent especially, the girl, how y'all doing and stuff like that. <laughs> I, I can't do the American accent at all, but you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. That sounds about as and good as my it... Glaswegian accent from the last podcast. <laughs> Oh, God. That's okay, though, because no one can do an Australian accent either, so at least I'm not the only dickhead. No, there are many dickheads around. Yes. Uh, A couple (laughs) of the girls try to do Australian accents. The only one that's been half decent is one year I called Cat Power to wish her Merry Christmas, and she answered the phone, G'day, mate. It's like, oh, God. She starts taking the piss out of my accent and talking Australian to me to entertain her mum, who was with her. It's actually a good effort. God bless Cat Power. Yes, I love me some Cat Power. Who doesn't? One of the Spoontopians. Yeah, this Spoontopia thing, I think uh, I think we just need to mention this as well. What the hell? <laughs> Basically, um, a bunch of the Commonwealthers started this group called Spoontopia, which is um, we carried around these spoons, which we called our credentials, and we just try to get as many pictures of us spooning stupid shit as possible. And I, I took her to Japan as well because I was the international ambassador for Spoontopia. And it was just a bit of fun. Like, I don't know. It's one of those stupid things you just do at Shimmer and enjoy yourself. Like, there, It's not the only dumb thing we've done that kind of flew under the radar a little bit. I don't know if you guys remember when there was a lot of photo crashing, photo bombs. Yes. Yes, you photo bombed one of our photos. Yeah. 
that actually came about because me and three of the girls decided it would be really funny to play um, a game where we photobombed the entire weekend and we got points for every photobomb, but we didn't explain to anyone what we were doing. So half of Gilda's photos have photobombs in them from that show. Me, Cat Power, Courtney Rush and Nikki Rocks. So we didn't fill anyone else in. So no one had a clue what was going on. Who won? Who won? Oh, Cat Power destroyed us. <laughs> I think it's because she could drink all weekend because she wasn't wrestling. So um, she, you know, had that drunken goal in mind. I'm going to photobomb the shit out of everyone. And the rest of us kept getting distracted. I'd like to say Nikki got slaughtered. Is that drinking wise or in the photo bombing game? Photo bombing game because she actually Which... didn't come to the second after party, so she lost some prime photo bomb time. You see, there's always a reason to go to both the after parties. Oh, exactly. I mean, especially night two because you've got the ridiculous shenanigans which are going to go on, and I think it's pretty entertaining personally. But you know, I mean, guests come and see. You know, head to the shimmer after party. And tell me for yourself if you think it's worth it. Tickets are still available for general admission for uh, both days, by the way. Not many left. They're still they're, 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 uh, kind of winding down a little bit, but there are still a couple available. You are a shilling machine today, Burton. Yeah, you know, I do well. Excellent. I'm, I'm all out of shills now, though. Well, let's, uh, let's finish up then by just saying, I mean, you've been to Shimmer... This be your eighth time. You've uh, you've done Japan. Presumably, Japan you'll be going back to soon. Yep. Um, what's 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 the long term plan here? Is it just going to continue to do Shimmer in Japan and Femme Fatale and Shimmer in Japan and Femme Fatale as long as you can do it? Or uh, I mean, what's what's the eventual plan? Well, I think I would be happiest heading to Japan in a long term basis, like kind of do what Haley does and spend a lot of time of the year there, but, you know, building up to that, uh, that would be my long-term goal at the moment. So you'd like to live there permanently? Yeah, definitely. I think that's pretty much the dream, so. But an achievable dream, though. Yeah, I, I would hope so. Um, I think a couple more trips on my belt and we'll see how we go. Have you got anything else... Uh planned already for for japan i mean is there a date in mind i don't know if you're able to talk about it or or what but have you got the next japan trip in your diary already uh, i don't know if i can really talk about it but you will be seeing tank in japan eventually i can't really be more specific than that sorry bloody country's gonna run out of tequila oh you have no idea oh i think we have a little bit <laughs> So I'm bringing Jaeger to Japan now. That's my plan. <laughs> oh, you poor Japanese people. Yeah. I think the nice thing is just watching yourself grow, like you're saying, over over the years. We've seen you, um, we've seen, like you said, at the start, and we didn't see your debut because we weren't there, but the second one we kind of built up this kind of rapport with you over over the years as well and uh you know if i take out the the, the, the beatings <laughs> which have been delivered to me along the way which uh you know, i'm very very grateful for thank you very much it's been great to, <laughs> to watch you sort of grow and expand as a wrestler to this point now where you know you, you're just so much of a uh of a complete package now and it's it's just fascinating to watch someone evolve that way over a over a period of time it's just been fantastic so uh i even though I have no hand in it, I'd like to say just, you know, well done you. You've done a great job. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Now, because of this arse licking, does this mean I'm not going to get hit? As long as you behave yourself. Okay, that works for me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know that's not going to happen, Lee. <laughs> yeah, once he's got a couple of drinks into him, we'll see how he goes. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Good Lord. Well, on that bombshell, uh, I'm going to draw this uh, conversation to a close and say, Kelly, thank you once again for uh, giving us some of your time tonight. It's been nice to, to chat once again. We will see you uh, at Shimmer and Femme Fatale. Anyone who uh, wants to go, uh, like Lee said, tickets are available, both shows. Come check them out. And uh, we will see you again next time on the podcast. No worries. Thanks for having me, guys.